The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. Where strange lights speed beyond reason across a clear night sky. The house at the end of the road, where disembodied voices whisper, and strange noises make the living shiver. Lurking shadows hiding on the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. Odd, true events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. I'm Wes, and that's my wife and co-host, Beth. Hello, everyone. Well, Beth, it's definitely cold out here in upstate New York, but it's warm and cozy in our studio, so I'm ready to get into tonight's stories. Where did your mind wander this week? Well, I came across a pretty amazing man, actually. Besides you, I mean. Oh, that's sweet. I can't wait to hear about this fellow. So- <laughs> So, John D. was one very cool dude. The man was the definition of Renaissance man. Or perhaps he was one of the first real magicians. He was called the Queen's Merlin, after all. As the court astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I of England, John D. was immersed in mathematics, astronomy, occultism, and alchemy. He was one of the driving forces behind establishing the 13 British colonies in North America. He had the largest library in England, and he created Enochian, the language of angels. Despite all this, or maybe because of it, since he was let go after Elizabeth was no longer in charge, he died in complete poverty and no one knows where he was buried. Oh, that's rather sad. He was born in 1527 and was so intelligent that he was accepted into Cambridge at the age of 15. There, he focused on science, magic, and religion, becoming very interested in stagecraft, of all things. He was so good that he designed a flying beetle for one performance that had audience members convinced that it flew across the stage by magical powers. Around the age of 19, he became one of the original fellows at Trinity College. He felt throttled by the narrow-mindedness of Cambridge, though, and transferred to the University of Louvain in Belgium, where he was free to study astrology, alchemy, Kabbalah, and numerology, among other things, in the way that he wanted. He taught math in Paris and traveled extensively around Europe. In 1552, he met another Renaissance man, Girolamo Cardano, in London, and the two of them investigated a perpetual motion machine and a gem that was supposed to possess magical properties. That sounds pretty cool. Very cool. Now, at this point, the dates get a little murky, but I'll try to stay chronological, at least the best that I can. In 1554, he was offered a position at Oxford, but since he didn't really like the way they did things, he turned it down. It was while he was back in London that he caught Elizabeth's attention. By getting arrested for treason sometime between 1553 and 1555, for casting a horoscope that claimed her sister Mary, who was the current queen, who also happened to be known as Bloody Mary, would become one of the most hated monarchs of British history. Mary, as you can imagine, was not particularly pleased, but Dee was able to defend himself and was exonerated. The church, however, had their eye on him, and they were quick to slander his name as often as they possibly could. Oh, I bet they did. But Elizabeth liked him and had his record cleared in 1556. That same year, Dee tried to convince her older sister, Bloody Queen Mary, to set up the first public library. She refused, which probably made him like her even less. So Dee set up his own massive library in his home, 
allowing scholars from all over to come use it. He had around 4,000 texts, making it one of the largest personal libraries in England. Unfortunately, most of the books and manuscripts were stolen in later years when Dee was off exploring the world. Well, he was definitely a Renaissance man. He definitely was. In 1558, when Elizabeth became queen, she referred to Dee as my philosopher, and he received the title of the Queen's Conjurer. He was also called the Queen's Merlin. He just happened to be a very skilled geographer and cartographer, too. He applied Euclidean concepts to navigation and even trained several sailors who went on voyages of discovery. He was so well regarded that even some legends sprouted up about him because people were so in awe of him. One legend was that the English defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588 because Elizabeth asked Dee to cast a spell on the enemy fleet, which he did. He was also revered as a strong political and social ally who Elizabeth relied on. He basically was her right-hand man, and he would even sign his letters to the Queen as 007, which was his coded way of saying, for your eyes only. It apparently had some sort of significance when it comes to alchemy, but it's kind of funny that it became James Bond's code name. Yeah, he was the first 007. He was, and there's some speculation that that's even where Ian Fleming got the idea for Bond's code name. I could see that. It was during this time that Dee was instrumental in England setting out to establish the 13 colonies in North America, and he's often credited with coining the phrase British Empire. He also just happened to help introduce the math symbols for add, subtract, multiply, and divide to the general public when he wrote the introduction to a book on Euclidean geometry. He published a lot of his own works, too, on everything from mathematics to religious texts. God, what didn't this guy do? I told you, he was a Renaissance man. By 1580, Dee stepped away from court life so he could delve even deeper into his own studies. It was during this time that he created Enochian, the language of the angels. Dee claimed that he had received instructions from otherworldly spirits, telling him about the language and that angels had their own alphabet, grammar, and vocabulary. And he was able to do it because of a man named Edward Kelly. Dee was convinced that Kelly was gifted at scrying. Kelly was 26 years old and supposedly had quite the drinking problem as well as a counterfeiting problem. In fact, both of his ears had been cut off as a punishment for his illegal activities. They used Dee's black mirror, which he claimed was made from Aztec obsidian. And actually, recent studies of the mirror proved that it is made of Aztec obsidian, so at least he was telling the truth about that. Dee swore he could use the black mirror to converse with, quote, good angels, and the two men documented their interactions with the spirits in spirit journals. During these sessions, the angels directed Dee to commission two artifacts, a version of the Seal of God and the Four Castles Gold Disc. Now, the Seal of God already existed, It was a magical diagram made up of two circles, a pentagram, two heptagons, and one heptagram, and is labeled with the name of God and his angels in Latin and Greek. Dee's version was slightly different, although the whole thing is so complex I had a really hard time understanding it. Supposedly, Dee and Kelly would place a crystal on top of the seal, which was placed on a table. But then they would take smaller versions of the seal made from wax and place one under each leg of the table. Several spirits would come out of the crystal. One was an elf-like female and another a jester-like male. But according to their journal entries, when Kelly sat in front of the crystal, an angel would appear with a wand. The angel would point to various parts of the seal and Kelly would interpret while Dee wrote it all down in their journals. The Four Castles of Gold Disc is literally a gold disc engraved with a circle in the center. Branching off the circle are four columns, each ending in a representation of a castle tower. 
There are inscriptions in each quadrant, and I'm not sure if this is what's inscribed, but Kelly is quoted as saying, East and west, north and south, stand four sumptuous and belligerent castles, out of which sound trumpets thrice. From every castle a cloth, the sign of majesty is cast. In the east it is red, like new smitten blood. In the south, lily white. In the west, green garlic bladed, like the skins of many dragons. In the north, hair colored, black like bilberry juice. Four trumpeters issue from the castles with trumpets pyramidal of six cones wreathed. Three ensign bearers with the names of God on their banners follow them. Seniors, kings, princes as train bearers, angels in four phalanxes like crosses, all in their order, march to the central court and range themselves about the ensigns. <laughs> so since I could barely read it, you can understand why I was having trouble understanding how all of it worked. Yeah, there's quite a bit there. It's a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> yes. But Dee and Kelly were inseparable, even when the good angels told them to swap wives. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> Now, this good angel took on the form of a jester when it appeared to them, but they always did what it said. So even though Dee's wife, Jane, quote, fell a-weeping and trembling for a quarter on an hour, she eventually agreed. Nine months later, Theodore D. was born, but it's questionable which man was the father. So it seems like the angels were a little bit kinky. Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> Not content to stay in one place, Dee decided to travel, bringing his partner and their two wives, of course. But he wasn't just seeing the sights. He was actually searching for buried treasure. Literally. He thought Kelly would be able to find some, using his scrying methods. Kelly did find some stuff, like a red powder he claimed was an alchemical component Dee was searching for. Kelly called it a powder of projection. Whether it worked or not, I don't know. But another one of Kelly's finds was a book of magic he thought Dee could decode. The book turned out to be a hoax. It was simply Latin phrases written in code by two Danish princes. But Dee, for whatever reason, never realized that Kelly was tricking him. I don't like this Kelly guy. No. I think he had some ulterior motives with some of the things that he was telling Dee the angels wanted them to do. Right. And people began to wonder if Dee was up to trickery as well, but not in the way you would think. Dee was able to get audiences with many of Europe's kings, and soon rumor spread that Dee was actually undercover as a spy. Yeah, but I wonder if the church was uh, responsible for those rumors. It's quite possible. And while there's no proof of it, it caused his reputation to suffer, and Dee had to return to England after just six years. When he returned, however, he came home to absolute ruin. His house and library had been totally ransacked, and all his books and many of his tools had been stolen. Occultism had fallen out of favor while he was gone, and the wealthy people who once loved him wanted little to do with him now. But Elizabeth was able to get him the position of warden at Christ's College in 1595. But by 1605, John Dee basically vanished into obscurity, existing on whatever money he could earn by peddling horoscopes. King James I was in power now, and without Elizabeth's support, Dee had nowhere to really go. He died in either 1608 or 1609 at age 81 in complete poverty. And, like I said, no one knows where his gravesite is. That's just so wrong. But he is remembered in a lot of ways, especially since one of his good friends was William Shakespeare. It is widely believed that the character of Prospero in The Tempest was based on him. And if you want to see any artifacts related to John Dee, they are out there. The British Museum actually owns quite a few, like his Aztec Black Mirror, the small wax replica seals of the Seal of God, a crystal ball, and a gold amulet engraved with one of Kelly's visions. 
D is also still talked about quite a bit in scientific circles because of his writings. In fact, he's connected to the totally mysterious Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is this totally wacky text full of fantastical plants and animals that scholars have been puzzled by for decades. Despite being taken in by Edward Kelly, who may or may not have been a fraud, John Dee was an incredibly educated and intelligent man. He explored all facets of what he considered science, from the physical to the metaphysical, and it wouldn't surprise me if his name comes up a lot more in our research for this show, or that it hasn't already, but I just didn't know who he was. Yeah, I can't believe that I've never heard of him before. Well, he's responsible for so many things in the things that we like. You know, like we've watched a lot of TV shows like Supernatural, where Enochian was a huge part of that show. Right. And I thought it was just something they'd made up. I didn't realize that it had a basis historically. Right. Well, that was a totally awesome story, dear. Thank you. Hey, did you know? We're not so original. Not even our slang. For example, the first time OMG was used was way back in 1917, when British Navy Admiral John Arbuthnot Fisher wrote to Winston Churchill, quote, I hear that a new order of knighthood is on the tapis. OMG. Unfriend first appeared as a verb in 1659, but it was a well-used noun as far back as 1275. OK became popular in 1840 when presidential candidate Martin Van Buren used an abbreviation of his nickname, Old Kinderhook, in his campaign slogan. So yeah, nothing new there. Who'd have thunk it? So now that I dazzled you with John D, where did your mind wander this week? Well, let's see if this piques your interest. The ghost of a vengeful guard dog, a cloaked woman with no face, a spectral stallion, a gatekeeper who has never left, the screams of battle drifting around the walls, even though no battles are being waged in present time, the moans of prisoners long since perished, echoing in the dungeons. It sounds intriguing. I'm piqued. Akashus Fortress has an abundance of ghosts. In fact, it's considered by many to be the most haunted place in Norway. We've said it before, and we'll be saying it again tonight. When a place is this old and has seen the history it's seen, how could it not be haunted? Akashus Fortress is believed to have been built by King Hakon V in the late 1290s, right in the heart of what is Oslo today. Its prime location, right on Oslo Fjord, made it the perfect place for a stronghold. But it was also intended to be a residence for royalty. It was such an important stronghold that as early as 1308, the first siege attempt was made by a Swedish duke, but he failed. Over the next 700 years, there were several siege attempts, one 1449, one in 1523, yet another in 1531, and yet again in 1567, and again in 1716, just to name a few, and all of them failed. The fortress was never occupied by an invading force until World War II, but I'll get to that in a bit. During and after each siege attempt, dissenters and enemies were imprisoned in the dungeons, where the usual torture dungeon activity was carried out. The whole irons and chains and isolation thing. But things in the prison dungeon were a little different than most. One part was called the slavery, because prisoners could actually be rented out to do manual labor in the city. From 1588 to 1648, King Christian IV expanded the castle, adding bastions on the east, south, and southwest. During King Christian's reign, the castle did survive the fire of 1624, although most of the medieval Oslo did not. The castle has had its share of well-known historical figures also. Prisoners, of course. 
As an American who knows nothing about Norwegian history, I found a few accounts that I thought were pretty interesting. I have no clue if these are well-known men in Norwegian history or not, but here they are. Christian Jensen Lofus was brought to Akasus in 1787 for being a prominent figure in the peasant revolts. He had led authorities on a nationwide hunt, and it was a big deal when he was captured. When he was brought to Akashus, he was kept in a cell very close to the main guardhouse so he could be watched at all times. Despite being shackled to a block of timber, a guard was ordered to check on him every hour just to make sure that he hadn't escaped. When people knew that Loftus was being held there, he became somewhat of a celebrity. The town's wealthiest man, Burnt Anchor, apparently said, this Loftus is a vile soul, a villain in the bourgeois life, and a stupid rebel in the political one. People run along to see this miserable man who dares fatten himself in his chains. Some will call this pathetic person a new Washington, but should I desire to see him, it would be to spit in his face. Wow, I guess we knew how he felt. Loftus was sentenced to a life imprisonment, including working while in irons. He died in 1797. Ole Holland named the Norwegian Robin Hood, robbed the Norwegian bank in 1835 before being caught and sent to Akashus. He was known for his 11 previous prison escapes, and even Akashus couldn't hold him. After four years there, he managed to escape again living on the run for three years before being caught and sent back to Akashus. Maybe he is one of the ghosts that people claim to see there because he killed himself in his cell. Following another rebellion in 1852, 18-year-old Lars Hedda was brought to Akashus along with all the other men involved in the uprising. All of them died in captivity except Lars, who went on to translate the Bible into North Sami the indigenous language of his region. During World War II, Akashus was under foreign control, for the first time, by the Nazis. Conditions there were so horrible that it was nicknamed Death's Waiting Room. Wow. At least 11 Norwegian resistant fighters were executed there, as well as other dissenters. Maybe several of the disembodied voices and footsteps people hear today at Akashus are from World War II. They could be former guards, former prisoners, or even soldiers. No one is really sure. As for the screams that people hear, those could be from any number of prisoners held there over the 700 years of time. Right. With that many hundreds of years and thousands of people there, it could be anybody. But most of the ghost stories about Akashas are not new. The stories themselves have existed for hundreds of years. The fortress itself spans the length of 14 football fields, and one of the most prominent ghostly figures seen within its walls is Mantelgeisten, the cloaked lady. She has long dark hair and is never seen without her cloak, and yet no one has been able to identify her as she is completely faceless. She is most often seen entering and exiting chambers, and then she simply disappears. She could have been a prisoner's wife or a guard's wife, but if she's been seen for hundreds of years, that's pretty cool. She's not as frightening sounding as the Malkinison, though. Translated, it means vicious dog, and since the tale is rather sad, I'm not sure I blame the spirit of the animal for coming across as vicious. The story goes that a gatekeeper way back in the 1290, when the fortress was first built, had a solution to the problem of the gate being the weakest spot at the fortress. He decided a guard dog was a great idea, except for whatever reason, he thought the ghost of one would be far worse than a live one. So he brought a dog to the fortress and buried alive near the Maiden Tower. That's terrible. The poor dog did allegedly come back, but with revenge. It's been said for years that if you are unlucky enough to encounter the vicious ghost guard dog and you don't escape, it will bite you. And if it bites you, you will die within three months. Believers in the Malkanison have proof. Shortly after the dog was buried alive, 
a horrible crashing sound was heard inside the fortress. Spooked that they were being punished for taking part in the dog's death, the soldiers refused to go investigate. Now, some say that the dog was buried in the ground, but others say he was bricked up into the walls. Either way, it's horrible. That it is. The commanding officer finally went down the dark hallway alone, sidestepping mounds of rubble, to discover part of the building had collapsed, apparently right where Malkanison had been buried. From out of the dusk and dark, two red eyes glowed. Stunned, the officer came face to face with a specter of the dog, which attacked him. The man and the ghost animal fought, drawing blood from the officer. It seemed as though Malkinison was going to win, until the officer grabbed a lit torch and threw it at the animal. The officer survived, but a month later was thrown from a horse and killed. And so were several other unlucky officers who spied the ghost dog, each one being thrown from their horses within a short period of time. If the dog is too much for you, people suggest that you just avoid that section of the fortress when you visit it. However, there's a ghost horse you need to watch out for, too. <laughs> there's just ghost animals all over there. Legend goes that a drunken Swedish man once stormed the castle, shouting that he was going to take over all of Norway. He and his horse were shot on the spot. His horse is still frequently seen. Although some of these stories might seem a little fantastical, it's the smaller, less flamboyant claims that I think are the coolest. Breath on the back of your neck when no one else is there. Disembodied footsteps down empty hallways. The sound of men in battle echoing off the walls. And these claims are from some pretty reputable people, since today, Akashus is home to three museums. The Norwegian Armed Forces Museum, the Resistance Museum, and the Prison Museum, as well as several government offices. Recently, the Prime Minister had his office there also, so the people reporting strange occurrences are museum employees and government employees. Wow. It definitely sounds like a cool place to visit, but probably not the place where you'd want to be the last person locking up at night. Well, it would be interesting. And there's a lot more of the history that I didn't cover because it wouldn't fit into our 40 minute and under format. Right. Which is why we try to remind everyone that you can check our sources for more information about the topics that we cover in our show notes, because quite often there's just way more than we could fit into a 35 or 40 minute episode. Well, Beth, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode. I think so. So we'll see you all next week for an all new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. See you soon. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to traveling with you again to the places where our minds wander. If you like what you heard, please take a moment and provide us with a five-star rating and a comment on your favorite listening platform. It really helps us move up the list and become more visible on the podcast charts so new people can find us. Thank you all for your continued support. See you all next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. <laughs>